Okay, uh, I'm going to read a paper called Black and Catholicism, which is about an African American writer. And you would say, why is he writing a, is he reading a paper from an African American writer at an Italian American conference? And, uh, well, there's a very pragmatic reason. Uh, it's what I know. So it's very difficult to write about what you don't know. And second reason, it's, it's the paper. So, uh, William Markle is 1947, best-selling novel knock on any door, one million cars on one year. The story of an Italian-American kid named Nick Romano, who goes from altar boy in Denver, Colorado, to bisexual prostitute and low-key gangster in a Chicago multi-ethnic and racially mixed slum, is a unique case in American literary history. His uniqueness is now that Markle was an African-American writer, who wrote about an Italian-American character because there is quite a history, actually. But the specificity of Marvel is that he was the first, and as far as I, as far as I know, the only African-American Catholic writer to write about Italian-Americans. So Mary Marx today insists that to Marvel, Catholicism is a non-institutionalized social-cultural form that allows him to overcome what, overcome what Protestant discriminatory normativity and address the racial question in America as a question of inequality, exclusion, and lack of belonging. Moderate, the Italian American investment is a reinvention of blackness as a way to experience human otherness as a signifier of inequality. This is the novel's first novelty, as well as the problem of the multiple cases with today's literary critics, which for the most part seem both reluctant and unequipped to consider religion as a non-doctrinal concrete form of humanism when it comes to literary canon formation. Is the only a chance, for example, that in mainstream anthologies of American literature, there appear only two Italian American writers, Pietro Di Donato and Don Delillo, both male, of course. Is the only a chance that neither of them is identified as Catholic, despite the evident influence that such a discourse had on them? And is the only a chance that neither of them is presented as an Italian American writer, in spite of the fact that both are children of immigrants? Be mindful, this is not only an Italian American issue, which is why I decided to take out Motley's novel for this conference. Motley knew all too well that he was working in the black literary tradition as a Catholic writer, the only such writer, given that Cobb McKay was a Jamaican born. And that tradition had already dealt with Italian presence. It's found in modern texts, which is Jane Weldon Johnson, the Edward York, and ex colored man. Likewise, in Sterling Brown, in Sterling Brown poem, Heart and Happiness, we have the cohabitation of two couples, one black and one Italian American in the street of Ireland. And a year before Motley started writing Knock on Any Door, William Hathaway had created a pro Italian encounter between African American and Italian American male workers in the steel mills of Pennsylvania. In other words, Motley at once inherited and shaped of a literary line that connects African-American male writers to Italian immigrants and their children. It is not a coincidence, I think, that Fred Garda Fair reaches out to Ralph Pellison's Invisible Man when he defines Italian-American as invisible people. Not many door, however, he was the first fictional Italian-American youngster as that an African-American writer has ever created. Motley was well equipped to do so because in the late 30s he had conducted a study of an Italian neighborhood in Chicago for the Federal Brazil Project, a study called Little Sicily, a 38 pages manuscript written for the Illinois American Guide series to which I returned at the end of my intervention. The, influ the influence of this uh, WBA film work informs a structurally defined <coughs> geography of the novel beginning with its center urbanism. Unlike Hathaway's block from the forward and Amazon Invisible Man, Knock on any door does not go north. Nick Roman and his family, <coughs> in fact, withdraw from the West. This is to say, the immigrant family withdraws from the frontier, a symbolic shadow of the American dream, due to the economic failure of the grocery store, which first forces the Romanos to move to the ghetto of, ben of Denver, where Nick's downfall begins, and then to relocate to Chicago. At the same time, by selecting an Italian American as main character in, a place, in place of an African American, Motley avoided a seemingly mandatory northward migration of black writers. By withdrawing the Romano family, Motley renounced the narrative possibility that the frontiers always offered American writers 
beginning with a book from which all American literature, modern American literature, comes from, as uh, Hemingway told us, which is Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Yeah, my view is that Model did not ignore these two thematic traditions. Rather, he reformulated them to what I call the invisible blackness of Italian Americans, the racially inflected protein dimension of immigrant humanism that allows Italian Americans to navigate between different racial realities broadly conceived. By which I mean a notion of race that is not limited to a solely color-based dimension. This is why Malfoy locates Nick Romano at the center of a multiracial, multi-ethnic, and multilingual, a proletarian street max of Lebanon, where, where one can hear, quote, men and women shouting their wares in horse, rasping voices, Jewish words, Polish and Russian words, Spanish, mixed up English. And once in a while you heard a chicken cackling or a baby clapping. They smell a hot dog, garlic, fish, steam table, cheese, pickle, garbage can, mold, and urine smells, end quote. No wonder that Nick's Roman Italian American is his primary link to the race. To race. The reason, of course, is that Motto was not an Italian American, which incidentally raises the question of what exactly is an Italian American novel. And conversely, what is an African American novel? But this is precisely what makes Nick Roman an interesting fictional character. Motto may not be a first ring writer in terms of aesthetics and language execution. Ideologically, moved progressively to the left after the end of the New Deal and at the onset of the Cold War. Stylistically, found himself caught in between the end of modernism and the first pangs of postmodernism. In other words, he's a transition writer, but one who's extremely astute. This is how he described Nick Romano's hair. I quote, he put water on his hair and stood in front of the mirror, commenting, he won't stay down, he's too covered, end quote. His two-party hair is one of the main ciphers of Nick's invisible blackness, which mostly ties to his Catholic upbringing. In the reform school where Nick is sent after he covers up the misconduct of Afrani, Nick cannot bring himself to say the N-word when he is asked to help another boy to wash the school's director's car. What happened to the Nick? Nick's FDR kid, meaning the African-American boy with a scared-to-death look in his face that Nick tries to approach before Brickstock. The racist and fascist like dog of the school stops him to warn him, I quote, we don't talk to no niggers in here, end quote. Clearly, Nick does not feel that Brick's personal pronoun we includes him. Neither does he feel that he belongs to that we. Just as Nick increasingly becomes aware of his invisible blackness, so does he yearn for belonging to with the other side. Right after Big Stop born, and Nick witnesses the school superintendent whipping Nick's friends, Tommy, who attempted to escape from the school along with other kids, including Sam, the African American that Nick intended to talk to. Nick gradually identifies with Tommy, who refused to submit to the Victorian normative law of the reform school, including its racial divide. Tommy is the exact opposite of Big Stop, to whom they finally responded, I'll talk to anyone I want. When the kids who attempted to escape are brought back to the assembly hall, Sam sits next to him. Then Tom is forced to pull down his pants, his buttocks naked for everybody to see, while the superintendent does his job with his strap. Quote, the smack of the whip again, cut in the flesh, bring in the blood, end quote. Now, in the hands of an African-American writer, this image requires a precise, acquires a precise double meaning. The literal one of the text, and the oligarchical one of African American history. An injury to the bodies what fuels mutual recognition. Although Tom is a white key, Mosley was not. And it's right after Tommy's whip in the next terms against everything that the reform school stands for, begin beginning with the crossing of the racial line, as he starts hanging out with Sam, the African American king, which eventually will force him to fight and be picked up. Neither does Nick accept the mission of the school that its director, Mr. McGuire, perhaps not coincidental as Scottish name, sums up as follows, quote, good habits, personal cleanliness, honesty, obedience, cooperation, respect for property, and they use a clean language, end quote. Nick's hostility to this universe is not an age of an revolt against authority. Nick rejects this principle because the school's mission is a company of Puritan discipline, the founding principles of capitalist system, and bourgeois respectability. In one word, Whiteness. And whiteness does not belong to Nick Romano, the Italian American kid whose hair is too curly. 
the weapon of time is an indictment of the nation's past, as well as the cipher of capitalist repression that is unleashed against the unprotected, the weaker, those at the margins, the excluded majority. This is what Nick's reacts to, the both in the bourgeois model world of white products and respectability, of which the reform school is a microcosm. In proper modern fashion, Nick becomes a display, a display subject of modernity, a continuously attempt to invert his position and become a subject of a new modern world in ethics, which the past as to the flat food or microcosm of Chicago reflects. Belonging and finding a home in his world. This is what Nick strives for, to no avail. The modern world that Nick uh, Romano faces for him a double extreme. Not only does he live during the Great Depression, I like the children and immigrants of Mount and Lego, for example, and another Italian American leader at the time. Nick does not inhabit two different worlds, neither. The Italian at home and the white American outside at school. He inhabits neither. What he inhabits is that is fictional universe that multi nations for him, the multiracial, multilingual, poor, sexually promiscuous neighbor. Rotting with filth and crime on Maxwell Street. One, however, that includes a carnival street with a black orchestra and a racial limit crowd during which, quote, a lean young negro black as the head he wore came out of the crowd and asked a pretty Italian girl in her teens for a dance, end quote. An invitation that the girl accepts. In this Mediterranean in this world, Mediterranean respect stands as both other than and opposite to the world of the reform school, to what he promised the ideal fictional character to build such war because his invisible blackness keeps race and ethnicity simultaneously in play as he gradually descends in the world number world of West Madison, where there are, quote, foreign appearing men but lighter than Italians, end quote. Motley's original inspiration for Nick Romano was a Mexican teenager whom he had met in a reform school in Denver. Italian American choice then is both not an intentional way to dress whiteness without falling in the typical black and white binary. This is clear when a cop when a cop stops Nick and his friends, Vito, Stash, and Sleepy, the latter an African American, to ask uh, this following question. To ask to question their, uh, their different nationalities. A question to which Nick replied, they ain't nothing is it in this country. The response operates at two interconnected levels. To begin with, Nick reverses the side position of the power relations between the institutional authority that speaks whiteness and the subaltern who have only their identity in each other. His questioning the policeman momentarily subverts the agency of power in its relationship, creating a positive shared space for mutual recognition of their universality as the condition of equality and freedom that the addition of in this country to the sentence underlines. Secondly, Nick subverts the idea of racial hierarchies, which he subordinates the concrete factors of inclusion. Nick knows that inclusion is the precondition for everyone to be seen and belong, the public recognition that guarantees the possibility to make oneself feel at home in the world. It is, of course, motley strategy to raise the question of social inclusion, which in this country, as Nick says, cannot be detached from the question of white. Underneath the skip rover of codes, the strictly theoretical presentation, it raises many and political questions, because the racial, the racial inclusion that Nick's invisible blackness fosters validates everybody's singularity as universal and disassembles white normativity. Motley's investment in an Italian American teenager with two party her response to this politics. Moreover, although Motley shows how poverty is the fuel of crime, he does not sanitize it. Unlike stereotypical Italian American gangster, Nick trusts people outside his own ethnic group and culture. The most important difference, however, is the aesthetic difference that betrays his invisible blackness, his obsession with his law, that his signature Marx Angels immortalizes, quote, live a good life, die young, and have a good looking corpse. End quote. <laughs> the sentence may be catchy, right? But the message is clear. Beauty transcends even death. The essence, culturally speaking, of Catholicism at least there since Dante's Vita Nova. By transcending death, Hitler rejects a continuous <coughs> attempt at the world of whiteness to control, to frame Nick, to not see him and all those like him. In other words, Nick Roman is the original invisible man, not because of the cliche attached to him, but because nobody sees his invisible blackness, his Italian American, Americanness, his popular Catholicism. Literary critics to begin with. 
At any time, the woman was family, the Chicago Housing Authority wanted to relocate elsewhere in the city. Told Motley when he was collecting material for this WPA essay as to why she would have moved, and I quote in Finnish, We ain't gonna move. They don't want us anywhere. We're niggers. 